Welcome at the uh, start of the Dutch Holocene. We're going to cover the early Holocene today. I assume that you've left the video course at the end of the Weichsel Ice Age, at the end of the Pleistocene, and you know all about the legacy of the land ice. And we're going to cover peat bog formations today, and we're going to cover the old maritime deposits in the west of the Netherlands. Now, this is where we left off. Um, at the end of the Weichsel Ice Age, that's roughly 15,000 years before present, um, we've had this situation where we have a very, very, very uh, um, low point over here, and this is this is where the sea is, and then this all of this is the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a lot bigger, and the sea level is very low, and there's some bulldolum over here, thanks to the Sala Ice Age, which crushed a lot of stuff. And there is a glacial basin, and there is a push moraine, and the rest of it is all pre-glacial sand and clay called the alluvial fan. And the wind was coming from the west, and it was super cold, and we had a tundra climate, and the North Sea, this uh, area over here that consists of sands and loess that was blowing all over the Netherlands, and this is where we left off. Now, climate starts to change. By the way, the boulder loam that was covered in cover sand. So we have we have a layer of sand, and in some cases we have a layer of loam, boulder loam underneath. Now this is the situation at the beginning of the Holocene. This is a push moraine, some erosional form, so it's not as high anymore. This is a glacial basin. It used to be deeper, but it's filled up with a lot of cover sand. This is boulder loam that used to be on the surface, but it's been covered again, cover sand. The, this, the sea is still all the way over here. And this is, the, this is the early Holocene. This is where we set off today. This is the start. And now what happens at the end of the last glacial is that the temperatures start to rise again. The temperature starts to rise. And it's very, very quickly in geological terms. This is, let's say... Um, the, this is the global temperatures, by the way. So global temperature of, I don't know, 10 or 10 and a half. And it shoots up almost to 15. And now we're even over over 15. A little. So the temperature shoots up very quickly in only a thousand years. Or it shoots up. This is in this is in thousands of years. So 10 means 10,000 years ago. Zero means now. And... Um, so in in a, in a thousand years it shoots up almost four degrees, and it's a lot warmer. And then it's not really stable. There's some warm periods, the climate optimums, the Roman climate optimum, the medieval warm period, and now we are here. The the little hockey stick is over there. And um, what happens is the temperature shoots up, it's quickly in the first 1500 or so years, and then it's more or less stable. It's not stable, but it's more or less stable. It doesn't go down all the way here, although you have some cold springs over here. The little ice age is the most notorious one of all. Now, in, in focus, what happens if temperature rises is that the ice that has been covering a lot of lands, that starts to melt. And a lot of that water comes back to the oceans. And once you start adding water to oceans, sea level starts to rise. And there is a second reason why the sea level rises as well, if you, if you turn up the heat, is that the water that's already in the North Sea, or in the oceans in general, that is very cold. And if you add warmth you increase the volume of the water that's already there because warm stuff takes up more space than cold stuff. Uh, water being an, an exception to this because ice obviously takes up more volume than liquid water. But if you have liquid water that is, uh, let's say, 10 degrees, and you make that liquid water 15 degrees, then the liquid water that is 15 degrees takes up more space. And so the sea level rises. Now, it goes quickly in the beginning and so the sea level rises quickly in the beginning. This is the North Sea water. See? Purple is the West Pacific. Green, that is, I don't know, the North Sea, but it's corrected. Anyway, the blue one is important for us. It shoots up very quickly from 10,000 years ago to 3,000 years ago. And this is 
And this is a lot, okay? We're talking 40 meters. So the sea level used to be 40 meters less. That's a lot. And then it shoots up and about 6,000 years ago, and then it rises some more, but it's not as steep anymore. This is very steep, and then this is less steep. So, And then here it's more or less stable. It stabilizes around the zero mark. Now, what that looks like in our cross-section is this. In a couple of thousand years, 40 meters, let's say the push moraine is 50 meters, it shoots up. And the Netherlands becomes a lot smaller because the ocean reclaims a lot of our country. And then, you know, now this becomes the sea land boundary. What happens also is if you turn up the heat, um, plants that used to be dead because it's too cold, they start to grow. So this is the Netherlands at the beginning of the, of the Holocene. This is the Netherlands in this position. And then we turn up the heat and we see the tundra change into a forest. As soon as you see these uh, trees over here with the needles, you are in a coniferous forest, and that is also known as a boreal forest. Boreal meaning pretty cold. Now, these trees, they grow in circumstances where the warmest summer month is at least 10 degrees. It should be 10 degrees once a month. It's the tundra line. If it's colder than 10 degrees, trees cannot grow and you have a tundra. If it is least one month that is on average warmer than 10 degrees, we get this, a boreal forest. But, you know, it, we turn up the heat even more and now we are in the temperate zone and we have uh, these forests, they're called de deciduous forests, and they have leaves. Trees with leaves, they need uh, more than 10 degrees and they need more than one month and they need a little bit more of moist and they need a, and they need a little bit more of everything. And this is the causal chain that changes the visible aspects of the Netherlands from a tundra through a uh, boreal forest the way we have on the taigas of Russia and on you know the plains of, of Canada and etc. And now we have these. And th this is the causal chain. First the temperature rises. Then the ice melts and the, the seawater that's already there starts to expand. So the sea levels rise. This is called a transgression. Transgression means a period of time in which the sea levels rise. It is the opposite of a regression in which the temperature is lower and there is more and more water stuck in the chain and it's more ice is growing and the sea levels go down. This has been this is known as a regression. So sea level rise transgression, sea levels go down regression. This the third part is that the tundra gets replaced by boreal forest, trees start to grow. These trees are coniferous. Then after that Temperature is even warmer. We get a deciduous forest. Leaf trees and the average annual temperature is around 15 degrees. This is the current situation of the Netherlands. Here we have the North Sea. This is our enemy. It tries to kill us with flooding. We don't like the North Sea as much. 1953, 1916. All right, a lot of people died. We do like the North Sea because it feeds us a lot of fish, herrings especially, but for the rest, it's our enemy. Then we have the plus one meter NFA line. Let's say that that's over here. And then we have a high and dry country over here that doesn't fear the sea at all. This part of the country, when, when stuff starts to flood, these guys, they're drowning. That's us. That's us in the west. And then over here, everybody's pretty safe because the sea can't get to them because it's high and dry. That's where I'm from. That's where I, I've moved away. I like living on the edge, I guess. Now, that plus one NFA line, this one, this is the sea level, NFA sea level, let's just call it that. Sea it's not the same because sea level on low tide is different than the sea level on high tide. Let's just say that the NFA is the average one of high tide and low tide. That's plus one. Where is it in this map? Well, it's over here. And so we can say that everything that is above the one NFA line that sandy soil, that's that sand, and this this 
has been influenced by sea level rise. This hasn't because the sea never got there. Influenced by sea level rise, high and dry. Uh, what does that look like in our map that we're using? Well, this is the NFA plus one line. This is the Hun line. And so we have this. This is the Pleistocene subsurface that is still showing. It's still above the plus one NFA. There's still Pleistocene subsurface. Over here, C done something. Over here, the C has done something. What happens when you have sea level rise? Well, you get this. You get peat bogs. Chapter 1. What is a bog and why should we conserve it? During the last ice age, Ireland was covered in snow and ice. When the ice melted, lakes formed. Plants grew around the lakes. After many years, they died and sank to the bottom of the lake. After hundreds of years, the lake became full of dead wetland vegetation. This transformed into what's called a fen. New plants such as sphagnum moss began to grow on the surface of the fen. Over thousands of years, the sphagnum moss died and accumulated and peat began to form. At this point, the fen became a bog. Trees began to grow on the bog and later died. As the peat accumulated, the bog grew higher, like a dome. It became known as a raised bog. Historical value. Bogs are really valuable for historians to help them learn about the past. A bog is high in acidity and can preserve items for thousands of years. Many items have been found in bogs still intact, such as manuscripts and even bodies. Carbon sink. Raised bogs are extremely valuable wetland habitats. Bogs act as natural carbon sinks. This means that they absorb the greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, from the atmosphere. The plants on the bog absorb the carbon, and when they die, the carbon is stored as peat. Bogs are also an extremely important ecosystem and provide habitat for many of Ireland's plants and animals. The natural wetness of the bog is what makes these habitats thrive. Flora of the bog. Sphagnum moss is an example of a plant which needs waterlogged conditions. It is probably the most important plant in the bog and is known as the bog builder. Sphagnum moss is incredibly absorbent and can hold up to 20 times its own weight in water. Over time, layers of moss grow, and when it dies and decays, it decomposes into peat. An active bog is one which is peat forming, one where sphagnum moss is growing. The bog is also home to many of Ireland's most beautiful plants, such as bog cotton, lichens, bog asphodel, and even cranberries. These plants have had many uses over the years. Lichens, for example, were used to color clothing before modern dyes were invented. Other plants are thought to have antibiotic properties. During World War I, sphagnum moss was collected from the bogs and sent over to France to treat wounded soldiers. One of the most interesting plants that lives on the bog is the sun dew. A carnivorous plant, its leaves are covered in up to 200 red tentacles. The glands produce a sticky substance which attracts many insects. It is thought that the insects mistake it for nectar. The substance traps the insect and the entire leaf bends over to engulf the insect and digest its body parts. This process can take up to two days. The sundew plant consumes about five insects a month. Insects of the bug. Many insects make their home in the bug. A large number of butterflies reside here. They are attracted by the wide variety of plants. Damselflies and dragonflies also love a wet environment and are often seen flying about.
many spiders, including the rare web funnel spider, also make their home on the bog. Birds of the bog. Aside from insects, the bog also provides habitat for a large number of birds. Snipe are very common. Other species, like skylark, are also found here. Fauna of the bog. A huge number of animals also live on a bog. Frogs thrive in a wet environment and are often found on a bog. Bogs also provide a home for our only reptile, the common lizard. Hares are also widespread and can often be seen on a bog. On a rare occasion, if you're lucky enough, you might see a fox prowling about. The bog has many benefits, from providing an insight into the past for archaeologists, to storing the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, to providing habitat for our wildlife. They are also part of our heritage, and something we all need to be proud of. Kuilta's Raised Bog Restoration Project is dedicated to restoring and protecting such natural wonders as bogs. It is up to the people of Ireland to ensure that the positive legacy of the project lives long into the future. Okay, cool. So, every time you hear the word Ireland, you can replace that and say that this is for the Netherlands as well. Uh, bogs are beautiful places, but how do they grow as a result of sea level rise? Okay, here we have a picture. And this is the picture 7,000 years before Christ. So, 9,000 years ago at the beginning of the Holocene. And here you see a Mesolithic fisherman. So this is the Stone Age, and he's fishing. And he's fishing in a lake. And there's a hazel and pine forest because it's still pretty cold. And, you know, all right. Here he is, and he's fishing. And this is the beginning of our peat bog right here. It's a lake. What happens is, well, these trees, they die, and they fall in. And, you know, here the... Um, Plants are, are living, and peat is growing as a result. Um, there, there was one of the, uh, of the plants that they named that was called the, the peat builder um, that, that can hold up 20 times its own weight in water. That's a lot of water. I'm 70 kilos. I'm a little more, but it makes it easier if I do 70. So I'm 70 kilos. If I could hold up, 20 times my own weight in water, uh, I would weigh 70 times 20, that's 140 with a zero, that's 1,400 kilos. That's a, that's a, that's a lot of weight to put on. Um, humans roughly have about 60 to 65 percent of their body weight is water. So this plant, it, you know, 20 times, that's, uh, that, that's a lot. So he takes up a lot of water and he he builds um, a lot of a lot of these peat. What happens is plants they live there and then they die and they they deposit on the bottom of the lake and then other plants grow on top of them. They die and they deposit on the bottom of the lake and so the the lake is filled up, especially from the sides with with peat, and this goes on for a while until the entire lake is filled up, and then a new phase of the peat bog formation starts to grow and that's trees and they you know while it is dry enough these these trees they can root in the bog and then there's a lot of carbon in here so it's you know good manure for the trees and these they're fertilized a lot and they grow and you know this was about 500 years before Christ then what happens is that the trees they also die thousand years later and other trees grow and these these bogs they turn into domes. Now make no mistakes, mistake. These domes in the Netherlands they were eight meters above current sea level. That's high. That's eight meters. That's your. That's you know my house is isn't even eight meters. My house is about six, I think. Maybe the school is about eight meters. So that's high. Eight meters is a lot. Okay. And then what happened? during the um, Industrial Revolution is that people came in and they discovered that this peat stuff, if you drain the water, if you dry it in the sun, you can make turf out of it and turf is a good fuel. You can put it in engines or you can put it at home, 
you know, in your stove and you have heat in wintertime. Yay. So they started to dig all these. And now a lot of the peat domes that were there uh, are gone now. And so you need to preserve it for all these beautiful natural reasons. And because it's a CO2 dump uh, and for all the other reasons that were that were in the clip. OK, so peat is the code word. Now, here we have our famous map again. And we know that this part of the Netherlands was never touched by the ocean. And so that's all Pleistocene subsurface. This is where we were, where we left before we took the peat intermission. Now, naturally, all of you understand that the rest of the Netherlands, everything below plus one NFA, is the boreal peat bog. And they grow from, I'm going to tell you, for 2,000 years, during the rapid expansion of the ocean, from 10,000 to 8,000 BP. All of this was boreal peat. There's more than one layer of peat in the Dutch surface. This is the boreal one. Okay, this is our cross section now. 8,000 years ago, the sea level starts to rise quickly and all of this becomes boreal peat and the rest is coniferous forest everywhere. But then the sea level rises some more. And so the, something happens to the boreal peat because, you know, sea covers it, most of it. And when sea covers stuff, it tends to break it with the waves. So a lot of this boreal peat has been destroyed. And also what the sea does is it deposits new sands and new clays. So the Pleistocene subsurface in the west of the Netherlands is covered by boreal peat. And then that peat has been largely destroyed and been replaced by old marine deposits, clays, and sands. Now, why do we call them old, even though they're only 7,000 years old? Because, as you guessed, there's also some new ones that come later. And this is the situation roughly 7,000 years ago. There is buried or destroyed by the sea boreal peat over here. There's some old marine deposits on top of it. The sea level transgression is almost done. The Pleistocene subsurface over here, not, not a lot has changed except maybe the trees that start to grow. Maybe the tundra is completely gone now and you have a boreal forest or maybe already even a deciduous one. And there's also some peat here growing, by the way. I didn't bother to put it down. But there's also some peat like the Grote Peel or in Drenthe. There are a lot of peat peat colonies as well. But this is this is our main cross section now. The Pleistocene subsurface, the Boulder Loam, the Glacial Basin, the Push Moraine, we know from the Pleistocene. And now in the Holocene, sea starts doing its job, putting down peat and putting down old marine deposits. If we put it in our favorite map, we can discover four landscape zones. This is the landscape zone in which clay and peats have been deposited on top of the Pleistocene subsurface and we have a lot of influence of land ice because ice was over here. Over here we have mostly sandy soils, occasional there is some peat, but there's lots of influence of land ice. Okay, glacial basins, push moraines, all that stuff. Over here we have clays and peats, but no influence of the land ice because the Hunt is over there and the ice never got so far south. And then here, there is sandy soils, occasional peat, and no influence of land ice either. So this one and that one are only different in the fact that this one had land ice and this one didn't. This one and that one are only different in the fact that this one has clays and peats and this one doesn't. Okay, well, you're smart. You, you understand. I'm going to leave it here for part one of the Holocene. We're going to pick it up in this position for Holocene Part 2.